So welcome to everyone here and uh, across the various time zones to this joint seminar and webinar. It's organized by the uh, Journal of Grand Change, Department of Development Studies and the uh, SOAS South Asia Institute. Uh, I'm Jens Lerge from Journal of Grand Change and the Development Studies. And we have uh, uh, Animas Paliwal, who is the Deputy Director of the South Asia Institute here as well. I don't know if you want to say welcome as well or... <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, so today's seminar is uh, a seminar webinar. It is also the UK launch of the book Gujarat, uh, Cradle and Harbinger of Identity Politics. And today's main speakers are the two authors of the book, uh, Jan Bremen, who's here, and uh, Gansham Shah, who is joining us online. Um, I, well, we will... We will see him later, I think. Um, the, 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 the seminar and webinar is also supported by uh, uh, Rumbitso, the student ambassador, and also people behind the scenes. So there's a bit of setup here. And finally, uh, Ed Simpson, who is the director of, of, of the South Asia Institute, will join us as a discussant online. He's tested positive for COVID, so he will have to be online. <clears throat> the topic of the book and of today's seminar is only too timely. The speakers and the book set out to analyze the genesis and dominance of Hindutva in Gujarat and by extension in India. To do that is even more important today than ever, uh, as the main Hindutva political party, the BJP, goes from one state election victory to the other, and as its majoritarian rule, by and large, is unchallenged. There should be important lessons to learn from focusing on Gujarat as the cradle and harbinger of, of this development. So let me now introduce to you the two speakers, even though the standard saying that the speakers need no introduction. Uh, in this case, is more true than usual. Certainly to me, they have always been around as significant go-to fixed points in an otherwise changing world of concerned and critical social science studies relating to India. Um, Jan Bremen has conducted anthropological fieldwork in Gujarat uh, since uh, the early 60s, 62. Uh, and his empirical research focused on the bottom segment of the rural and urban workforce discusses the changing plight of labor in the colonial and post-colonial er era through numerous books, uh, um, um, articles, etc. Going back more than once to the same sites of investigations enabled him to trace the shape and direction of the political economy of one of India's leading states, Gujarat. And the book, Capitalism, Inequality and Labour in India, 2019 to 20, is an overview of his quite disconcern disconcerting findings. This is the book before this. Uh, Jan Bremen is Professor Emeritus of Comparative Sociology at the University of Amsterdam and an honorary fellow at the International Institute of Social History also in, in, in Amsterdam. The second speaker is uh, Gansham Shah. Just bring him up on the screen possibly, Let's see if we can do that. Um, Gansham Shah is now an independent researcher and, and retired professor of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University um, in New Delhi. He was earlier uh, director and professor of the Center of Social Studies in Surat in Gujarat. He's also held the Ambedkar Chair Professor at the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Academy of Administration in, in Missouri and several other positions, including fellow in residence at the Netherlands Institutes of Advanced Studies in Vasana, uh, et cetera, et cetera. He has also authored and co-authored, edited numerous books, including Social Inclusion and Education in India uh, from 2020, uh, Democracy, Civil Society and Governance, Growth and Development, Which Way is Gujarat Going from 2014, Untouchability in Rural India from 2006, and the classic Social Movements in India, first published in, like in, in, in 1981. <clears throat> so 
uh, with this brief introduction to, to the main speakers, I will first give the word to Jan Bremen for a fairly short presentation. We have circulated a, a short video based uh, on an interview with Jan Bremen and, and presenting evidence from Gujarat uh, from 2013 for people to watch before the seminar, and I hope you've done it. So we did that so that Jan can concentrate more on big picture stuff in his presentation here. And so we take for granted that people have, have watched that. After that, uh, Gansham Shah will discuss aspects of the Gujarat experience in more detail. And around 45 minutes from now, we should then proceed to Ed Simpson's comments and quest, and then a question and an answer session. But for now, I'll hand over to you, Jan. Thanks, uh, Jens. <clears throat> First, uh, let me uh, make clear that Gansham Shah and, uh, and I myself, we know each other for most of the years that I've been working on India, uh, uh, for most of the years. And uh, we are good colleagues, but we're also good friends. And uh, that helped in uh, beginning this, uh, this book and ending uh, the book. We've closely worked together and are very happy that it got published. It so happens that most of my work on uh, India is, uh, has been published by one uh, major uh, publisher in India, Oxford University Press. Uh, they refused this book. It's not on our agenda uh, at the moment. Uh, the issue of communalism is not on our agenda. Uh, and that was the same reply that Gansham uh, got, who has uh, published most of his work with Sage. And also Sage said, uh, no, sorry, we won't uh, do this. That speaks about the, the way uh, that Hindutva is being discussed in, uh, in public. It is not being discussed in public. It is only being discussed by Hindutva and those who admire and are pro proponents of uh, Hindutva. The others uh, who are uh, of a different view, of the opposing view, that uh, Hindutva is not in the best interest of India, uh, they are what I would call underground, a kind of illegality. And I use that in the meaning that I experienced when I was a very young boy, of school aging boy. I was, I was advised not to do that, but I'll do that now. I hear it also. Sorry. Shall I begin again or not? <laughs> okay. Uh, the new meaning of illegality. Uh, as a young school going boy, our country, the Netherlands, was occupied by Germany. And I have often uh, had the feeling, I, I, I experienced occupation, occupation in the, in the sense that the government who lords over you is not your government, it's another government. It's not only another government, it's a hostile government. You don't feel happy, but there is not much you can do about it. And what struck me uh, while doing my research at the bottom, basically, of the economy and society of India, in Gujarat uh, in particular, that uh, the people who interested me most are living under occupation. It's, they are occupied in the sense that they the, 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 when I first went to Gujarat, it was under uh, another uh, uh, political regime, the Congress regime. And the saying then was that uh, Sarkari Mababche, uh, the government is our mother and father. The government has, now, has never been the mother and father of the dispossessed, of the disenfranchised. But certainly, it is not now so. Uh, the government is not the mother and father of the disenfranchised, 
they are even not uh, citizens of uh, the country. Uh, they are not considered citizens of the country. So this uh, comparison between what I experienced as a young boy uh, basically flavors my uh, thinking on what Hindutva does at the bottom of uh, the economy and society in, uh, in India. And uh, the video which was uh, sent to you, to, to all those who registered, uh, show it's a recording an interview which I had in 2013. Uh, and I more or less summed up what the leader then of uh, the Hindutva already uh, and the, the chief minister of uh, Gujarat, Narendra Modi, what his impact had been on the fabric, on the social, political, and economic fabric of uh, Gujarat. Now it's nearly, it's almost 10 years later. And what I felt then, what I felt then, has it changed my feelings? Have my, has it changed my views? And uh, it's almost uh, 10, uh, 10 years. And uh, I was appalled of what it had meant to the people I care for. And there are many of them in Gujarat. I was appalled in 2013. And I talked to my friends and colleagues. He's coming now to the national level soon. That was very clear in the upcoming elections then of 2014. And I'm scared. I'm scared for the future of uh, India. I'm scared for the future of people living in, uh, in India, many people living in India. And they laughed at me, my friends and colleagues outside Gujarat. Ah, he could do that in Gujarat. He won't do it. He won't be able to do it. We won't uh, allow for that, uh, that it will happen in India. In my feeling, it has happened in India. And that's why I will in the short introduction I uh, have, uh, I will uh, focus on the similarities between the German occupation in the Netherlands under Nazi rule and the Hindutva rule in uh, India at the moment. What were the main features of Nazi governance in my country? In the first place, there was the Führer principle. The Führer principle, the leader who leads his, his fold to the glorious destiny, the future destiny. And like uh, Adolf Hitler holding forth in Mein Kampf, my struggle, Narendra Modi holds, holds forth in what's going on in India today in praising, commending, commendable things. As I said, as a shepherd tending to his flock. It is a Hindutva mission advocated in a Mein Kampf mindset. It's the idea of genetic superiority of a master race of people that were the Germans, the master race of people, as the chosen people. They are chosen because of their Aryan genetics. They are superior. And there is the other side. There are the Untermenschen, the subhumans, who don't count and who shouldn't be there because they are blood on the nation. They don't belong. The Herrenvolk versus the Untermenschen, the subhumans, as the inferior species. What I see, and that was very much what I experienced as a young boy. I was a young boy. I was not an adult uh, man. But was a, I was sufficiently young and alert to understand what was happening. I saw what was happening. I felt it was happening. It had an impact on me and on the household to which I belonged. 
It's the denial of equality and social justice in the structure of society. And as Nazi rule in Germany was stratified, was a hierarchical, uh, uh, was a hierarchy. So Hindutva is a hierarchy. With the big brother and his twice born at the commanding heights, the hangers on in the middle rank, and the foot soldiers down below. It's, Hindutva is not equal. It is a hierarchy. It is very much based on inequality. And that, of course, is the ingrained heritage, the structuring of inequality in society and what society does and doesn't do. And there is also the need to segregate those who do not belong to the fold. There is a need to segregate them. They don't belong. They shouldn't be there. And they should be segregated from mainstream society. This is the phenomenon of ghettoization, which I saw as a young boy in Amsterdam, when the, the Jews were taken out of their houses throughout the city and were deported in a viertel, in a quarter of the city, which was meant for the Jews. And their apartheid, it was not only the, the, the it's are not only the Muslims in India who are ghettoized. It's also the laboring poor who do not have enough to climb above the so-called poverty line. Wherever they live, they live in slums, either in the city or in the countryside. And not just in the village, separated, segregated in the village, in their own colonies, separated from mainstream society. And their apartheid, because that's what it is, has to be made visible, publicly visible, as the Jews had to wear, and that's why you could see a yellow star. They don't belong and they should be, they are beyond the pale and should be made aware that they are beyond the pale. Another feature which reminds me of what I experience is the paradigm of collaboration and resistance. And that's when I said, talking about resistance, there is a new illegality. It's speaking against the dominant trend, the dominant authority, but you have to do that underground. There is an underground press in India coming up, particularly in the social media, because the mainstream only dis disseminate the propaganda and the fake news. If you want to know the counterfailing news, the truth, you have to go to other media. But the collaboration begins with the economic and political profiteers at the top, big business, as big business in Germany was Nazi, was Nazi fight. A dedicated cater of adepts and proponents dis dispelling, disseminating, the faith, the faith of Hindutva. And for that, BJP is the political platform with a variety of front organizations. As the Nazi party had a lot of front organizations around them to organize society. Nazism was organized. Hindutva is organized. Uh, 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 a variety of front organizations with the RSS as the think tank. There is also the vigilantism, the vigilantism in cadres undergoing military training. You've seen that on the video. But also volunteers, volunteers who spontaneously, quote unquote, assemble in mobs for lynching parties, lynching parties for those 
who don't toe the line or who go beyond their inferior presence. There are the razzias, which I experienced as a young boy, that uh, the strong army of the state cordons off neighborhoods and carries out search parties to find out who is who, what's going on. The strong arm of the state also to wipe out popular protest. The regime resorts to wide-scale trespassing of the law and the obliter obliteration of acquired rights, which the regime systematically resorts to. That's the side of the collaboration. On the other side, the opposite side, there are the social and human rights activists who practice illegality, as I said, but illegality in this new underground meeting, speaking against, acting against, or dissenters going into hiding as people in also in my uh, household went into hiding to escape from the reach of the state. They became illegal. They went underground to remain beyond the reach of the Hindutva juggernaut of power and authority. And in between there, the collaboration and the resistance, there is the broad middle ground of bowing down in intimidated acceptance. In addition, there are all those who pretend they, that they do not see, who are willing to soft pedal the malign impact of the Hindutva politics, or wanting to ignore and just keep mum. That broad middle ground is very much there in India. Then there is what in, uh, in German is called Kleichschaltung, the Nazification of society and authority, by which Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party success successfully established a, set, uh, a system of totalitarian control. over all aspects of German society and countries occupied by Nazi Germany. A Nazification from economy to trade unions, to media, to culture, to education, also to healthcare. The imperative need of the totalitarian state to establish a surveillance apparatus a surveillance apparatus to control disloyalty with the police and the judiciary as its instruments. And those who refuse and resist run the risk of detention without trial. The Nacht und Nebel, the night and fog operations, the fake encounters where people are taken out because they are too dangerous to the established regime. They are taken out in fake encounters. The loss of freedom and of speech of organization, which you learned also as a young schoolboy, to keep silent, not to notice, not to observe. The withdrawal of the right to citizenship and the distribution of public provisions for those who fail to join the fold or are not eligible to join the fold. The Muslims, the laboring poor, those who are not able to organize their own livelihood are basically dependent, pauperized on the state, but don't get the provisions because they are willing not to adhere to the Atma Nirbar doctrine. And another, the last similarity, Hitler came to power winning elections. And Modi has come to power winning elections. But having won elections also 
introducing majoritarianism, that obstructs democracy, that abuses the rule of law, and secularism, as laid down in the Constitution, the replacement of a culture of diversity by insistence on sameness, and the invoking of hate instead of tolerance to the other. All similarities, but one dissimilarity, and a very striking one. Nazism was defeated by an alliance of forces, hostile to Nazism. And those who were hostile to Nazism, they belonged to a variety of opinions and worldviews, how to organize society, what to do with the economy. But they were united in defeating the main enemy. That similarity is not in India. You do not see a coalition of those political parties and sympathies which do not belong to the Hindutva fold. I think we should now listen to Gansha. Thank you very much, Jan, for this <clears throat> powerful comparison, which we no doubt will return to in, in the discussion. Thank you. Let us indeed move on to Gansham Shah. Gansham, over to you. Thank you very much, the SOAS and Institute, for organizing this function. Um, this uh, is a really coincident that for more than a four decades back, during my young academic journey, I spent three months at SOAS back in 1976. It was emergency and I was a young scholar in an exchange program between UGC and British Council. And what Brahman has said, during that time, the Indian embassy instructed me not to participate any procession or in meetings opposing the emergency. Well, you get that kind of situation in a different way uh, in 2022. Uh, I'm happy that, and I recall that I have spent good time and the interaction with Professor Adrian Mayer, Terry Bias, uh, David Taylor, uh, Peter Robert, uh, and next door, uh, next door dad, I don't know at present, uh, Institute of Commonwealth Studies, Professor Moise Jones. So at the fag end of uh, my career, uh, I'm, I feel that I'm privileged to be back to SOAS and become a somewhat nostalgic. Thank you very much for this. Jan has very rightly described what he experienced during his young days in Netherlands. And you cannot have the two kind of thing, but ban list uh, uh, similar situation is developing in India. Uh, freedom of speech, institutions decay. And there are a lot of uh, constraints on those who really disagree with the government. Yeah, I, I know the yarn is a nightmare that 
what he saw during his school days in Netherlands made the peak in India. I just don't know. I don't want to go into it. And let me straight away come to what in that, uh, this uh, book, except the three chapters, the most all chapters uh, I have written over 60 years. I first wrote in 1969, which is there, and the last one was 2019. So it's a long journey putting whatever the writing that I could do it, and Ian focusing on laboring class, we are put together. Uh, all throughout uh, my journey is questioning. Okay, I just uh, when I started, there was not uh, Hindu was not very much on agenda. Not in India, not in India. Uh, I will come back how it has developed. But how gradually it has developed in Gujarat, uh, I have tried to probe into it. And simultaneously, I was trying to see factors and their interplay uh, for the rise of what we see today is the Hindu politics in India. First, we experience in Gujarat, and now Gujarat is a model for all India, because Gujarat Chief Minister, earlier Chief Minister, is now the India's prime minister. And all along, my concern is to understand the strategies of the property classes uh, to perpetuate their dominance and the methods they evolve. And I'm more interested how they legitimize and develop the hegemony in society and more so on the operas. Obviously, the operas have often registered, sometimes revolted against the property classes, what in Indian context is the classes and the caste. And it, because the caste is important because the Hindutva is a Brahmanical the construct where, as Brahman is saying, inequality is central. I will again come back in a moment. Uh, and more puzzling for me for last four decades, I would say from 1980s onwards, that how the oppress, or at least a section of the oppress, were resisting uh, and struggling against the powerful. And some of them got co opted, not only got co opted, but also they legitimized the Hindu to politics. And that is uh, my puzzle all along for last four decades. And I'm still, uh, do not have a definite answer to it, but I'm on the, trying to probe uh, constantly on that. And the question that puzzles me is that, why, the operators have not been able to get united among themselves as operators to fight against the operators. And these are the 
three, four questions about the strategy, resistance of oppress, uh, disunity and unity. These are the broad questions that I have, I have tried to probe all along. And for that, I have moved forward and backward. Uh, deformulated my questions. Uh, and from 80s onwards, because I also grew in my understanding of phenomena, from 80s onwards particularly, uh, what is the nature, or what was the nature, and what is now a nature of communal consciousness or the Hindu consciousness among the majority people? Or more happen to be oppressed, both in terms of caste and class. Uh, and another question that is there all along is those among the oppressed section who have become a broad middle class, because my definition of middle class is not Marxian. Uh, I would go, and I believe that peasant consumerism has percolated and penetrated the capitalist values among the poor. Uh, and that is not only India, but I would say the world over. And that is a new phenomenon. Uh, which really puzzles me. And while doing these studies of 80s uh, and 90s, and obviously 2002, uh, while as a member of the Inquiry Committee Commission of the 2002 uh, communal carnage, I was myself puzzling how this kind of a consciousness has developed. Uh, that why the oppressed who were really, till other day were really resisting and fighting, why in the 90s and 2000s, join hands and also become an instrument, handle of the property classes, the proponents of the Hindu politics against the other oppressed who happen to be of a different religion. And while talking to people and this and then also it's not talking to myself because my own life work, uh, I was interrogating myself. And then led me to go back to historical processes. And in this book, the first two chapters are the fresh one. And perhaps, uh, in fact, that is the time, the delay of this book. Uh, and I appreciate and I have patience for that. Uh, and while doing these historical things, uh, I have really followed historians who have done work in the medieval Gujarat and the 19th century. Period. And I would like to name Samira Sheikh, Isaka Riho from Japan. Arutna Kapadia, I believe she was once associated with Soas, Nicholas Ducks, and others. And of course, which really prompted me to read back was Soas' own book on idea of Gujarat, which I believe the idea of Gujarat is different than the idea of India. Uh, and first two chapters are 
mostly because I, I'm not a historian. Uh, I've read, try to understand, digest, and then I have tried to contextualize in my way that historical process over a period of time, uh, which I now believe, which grew from the 19th century and 20th century, and help the consolidation of the upper caste and class, so the property caste and class, uh, where the Hindu tour is a somewhat cementing force, uniting, apparently uniting the oppressed Hindus and the property upper caste Brahmins and Banyas. And in this, in the early 19th century, uh, Orientalist and Andrewist, uh, the kind of a policy that they form, which I call a project of a colonial modernity. And this project is evolved by the Western administrative system and concepts that they develop about the civilizations, about the society, about the progress, about the race, and so on and so forth. And the property classes uh, who were dominating but not enjoying uh, the hegemony in society, uh, they got the opportunities uh, or the British provided them opportunities for developing, for their own purpose, for developing agriculture, allow them to cultivate land in far areas, cultivated by the oppressed classes who were scattered, they, were, they didn't have a know-how, you know, uh, provided them technology, and also industries and that know -how. And that process really reinforced the property classes uh, to dominate or find out the ways to control the operas. And in this process, the census, the uh, system of government, government ability played a very important role. Enabling the upper state to consolidate their positions and reinvite the sociocultural network. What they did is that having got the advantage of education, Western education, printing media, printing books. So the new agency is the first agency of production, material process, agriculture and the industry, but simultaneously the control over the agencies of production of knowledge. And that was the beginning of reconstructing uh, the communities and then image of the community. And that really, I think in 1860s, uh, they started writing the history, what in Gujarat we call Itihas, uh, following 
the British categories, and also in methodology. Uh, writing textbooks for the schools, standardizing the Gujarati language is the only standard language for everybody. And in that process, they eliminated the language as a wrong language of ordinary people. Uh, uh, in Gujarat, we're speaking. And that process has still continued. It's not ending. It's an ongoing thing. But all this uh, really built the value system that was a Brahminical. And that really post census. And this post what the sociologists call the process of Sanskritization. That the poor and oppressed with emulating those who are closer to them, little bit off, also began to reinvent in a Brahminical model. Uh, and this really, really built up over a period of time the Brahminical structure. However, at the same time, in this process, the section of the oppressed, those who got the benefits of this education, because it was not closed Brahminical structure. In fact, the Orientalist wanted to give only the Brahminical education, only to the Brahmins in upper caste. But the Macaulay's and subsequent modernist or NGOist police has really opened some space for the uh, And what happened in other parts of Gujarat, uh, in India, say in the in a Maharashtra or the South India, or a part of West Bengal or part of Delhi, of a movement of the oppressed for a social justice. This was a some talk in Gujarat in 19th century. But that has never happened. So unlike South India, unlike Maras, Gujarat has not witnessed, or even you, part of uh, uh, UP and Bihar, Gujarat has not witnessed the backward caste in the present technology a moment. Some who got opportunity of education to become a white girl, they started registering it uh, under America's ideology. Some got co-opted and some accepted the situation at a flat company. And this process uh, has really expanded and accelerated under the mix, so-called mixed economy and nearly economy in the post-independent uh, When I talk about uh, historical processes, uh, one cannot talk about the 20th century of Mahatma Gandhi. Because he dominated, he was from Gujarat and he dominated Gujarat public life for nearly more than three decades from 1920s to 1940s. And there's a bang of his followers, Gandhians, Sarodhi workers. Gandhi was strong from since 1906 for Hindu Muslim unity. He believed for a non religious nation. He was deadly against theoretical Christians. And for that, for Hindu Muslim unity, 
he supported the Khilafat movement. And subsequently, he died for that cause. But at the same time, though he rejected the scriptures, it's not a Brahminical scripture, he said that if the scriptures support the untouchability, I don't agree with that. But at the same time, and I would say that because of his life work, because he was from upper caste, and kind of environment in which he grew during the young days before going to Africa and thereafter was under the shadow of Orientalist of India of a glorious past. So during the first four decades where the team of workers developed under him, uh, he really pushed work for the oppressed as the part of the seva, a compassion for them. But this compassion was essentially without empathy and with elderly brother brotherly attitudes. And by doing these things, the guardians really inculcated the Brahminical values among the oppressed, encouraged them for imitating the upper caste and not opposing them. He avoided the conflict. In the same manner, he founded the in 1920, 1918, uh, textile trade union. His principal boss and has been continued is a class collaboration. Not only that, during 40 years and thereafter, the, this textile unions though tried for the Hindu-Muslim unity, but at the same time, encourage the Brahminical rituals, symbols, and idioms among the workers. The workers remain a worker, a Dalit worker, a Koli worker, a Muslim worker, and not able to develop a workers as their identity. I personally feel, I have not done study, that the radicals who don't, they believe in the class conflict and radicals of all varieties mostly coming from a Brahminical class. They also share the Brahminical values. And that was the reason why for long period they ignore the cultural dimension of the caste in Indian society. Now, in the book, uh, there is a one chapter of study of 1960. Nine I've studied that. And I also studied the 1973 riots in Ahmedabad, which is not in the book, but was published in economic and political reaching. I'm convinced that riots are engineered. They are created for creating a social insecurity, inculcate nationalist values, uh, Hindu nationalist values, and also inculcate militant Hinduism. 
what I saw in 69 diets as a young scholar, I have closely observed in Yan is in this book also is, uh, at, uh, chapters of that, to find a similar pattern. But what is important that I need to emphasize is that the 1973 diet that I studied, I was fortunate to get the police data. And I found that those who were actively participating in and were arrested, all of them were in, from a lumpen working class. But important in the present context is that majority of them belong to upper and middle caste and not the OBC, Dalits, or the tribes. From 1980s onwards, the proportion has completely changed. The larger proportion of the active participants in the violence happen to be from the oppressed classes. And the upper caste participants have gone into background in mobilizing uh, engineering and planning the riots. And that's what you can see in the subsequent things. And that really bothers what happened in 1980s. Um, um, uh, this, is, this is extremely interesting and I can see how your ar argument is unfolding, but in order to give time for questions as well. Could I ask you to bring it to a close within the next five minutes or so? Thank you. I would say that I just take a few, four or five minutes and I just stop it. Uh, uh, just I want to mention about the 1980s, which was a turning point. Uh, the Hindutva, the proponents of Hindutva, the RSS, slowly the priority was build the culture rather than capturing power immediately. From the 1930s onwards and 1980s, they evolved a certain concept like a samrasa, homogeneity, diverted so-called backward caste movement in Gujarat to the anti-Muslim movements and, the, and and also capture almost 80% of the middle mainstream civil society in that project. And ultimately what I am witnessing in Gujarat that except a few minorities, persons here and there, the mainstream civil society and the state are almost the same. And that makes it difficult for a radical section of the civil society to operate and resist their voice. They do it continuously. And what Modi did in Gujarat of side checking people, uh, uh, eliminating the dissent voices, uh, abrogating the institutions and creating a fear. And from 2003 onwards, the capitalists openly come in his support and they declared that in 2003-2004 that they declared that Modi is the best CEO of India. And that process continued 2012 and we were able to become India's prime minister almost using the same techniques. Thank you. Let me add that.
I'm, and I'm sorry that that if I if I cut you a bit short, but because it was really these these discussions of how uh, BJP and and Modi grew out of 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 that historical background is of course hugely interesting, um, and I'm sure we will return to it again. Uh, for now, though, uh, I will hand over to Ed, Ed Simpson. Thank you very much, Jens. Good evening, everybody, whether you're on campus or on the webinar. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to um, extend a warm welcome to you at SOAS and remind you that we are in a university, a uh, home of academic debate. We enjoy challenge, we enjoy argument, debate, um, but we also believe that many different opinions can be expressed with respect and there's nothing in this environment that couldn't be said with politeness. Mm -hmm. So it's a difficult task to be a discussant in this environment. Um, the authors of the book we're here to launch are two of the most respected and senior scholars um, in my own field, writing about Gujarat in Western India. Um, I have studied their work for many years. Um, and in the case of Professor Shah, I have read it meticulously as a chronicle, really, of history and politics in post-colonial Gujarat. And I'm mm -hmm. delighted that uh, Jan Bremen and Gansim Shah have collaborated um, together in producing this book. I think the collaboration is particularly important because of their seniority, their knowledge of history, of class and caste politics in the region. They bring such experience and long-standing scholarly interest together speaks for the importance of the message that is conveyed in this book. So as the evening is drawing on, I will confine my comments really to four questions, uh, which can be put quite succinctly, I hope. S since Modi moved on from Gujarat and took up residence in Delhi, we've had three chief ministers in the state, Anandi Patel, Vijay Rupani, and Bupendra Patel. I sometimes feel sitting in London, it's almost as if they are not there. They have no presence on, a, on an international stage. Um, and indeed, uh, Bupendra Patel's own website has more of Narendra Modi on it than it does about his own politics. So I suppose my question is, what has happened in Gujarat after Narendra Modi? And is it significant? Have the chief ministers been left in place, in essence, as project managers? Sort of job done kind of scenario in Gujarat, now we can move on. But Anandi Patel, I note, is now governor of UP, which is a particularly significant um, appointment given forthcoming elections and the constellation of politics in the, in the country. So each of my questions is a riff off the key word in the title of the book. And to remind everyone, that's Gujarat, Cradle and Harbinger. And finally, we come to identity politics. So my first, that was my first question about Gujarat. The second question is about the cradle. And I think probably if I can imagine the text, you tell the story of how particular caste and class configurations emerged in Gujarat. But I suppose as a discussant, I want to ask if you think there's anything intrinsic to that composition of caste and class interests that meant that the Hindutva project took off in Gujarat rather than in Maharashtra or Madhya Pradesh, for example. The harbinger question is about having observed as well politics in Gujarat myself, not over such a long period of time, but I was really struck when the Swami Narayan Bats Sek opened the Akshadam temple in Delhi in 2005 they changed the liturgical language from Gujarati to Hindi. That was a major 
cultural and political statement. So I suppose I'm also interested in asking the two of you what else you think has changed as the Hindutva project has gone from provincial state formation to a national level. And the final question I have is about identity politics, but in an academic context, in this case, in SOAS um, and in this particular event. And I'm going to ask it in the most naive possible way. Both of you have written about very similar things for a very long time. I understand that this book is a fantastic collaboration that brings together your collective experience and wisdom. But I want to ask you who this book is for in your imagination. And who, so who is the reader and what would you like your reader to do with what they read? Thank you very much. <coughs> thanks so much, Ed, and thanks for doing this in spite of COVID. <laughs> this, uh, that is much appreciated. Uh, I think we should have a, a quick round with the, with, with the two speakers to comment quickly on the on the question we can we can maybe throw in uh, one other questions before we go no, let us let us do that first please um well um this round let us start with you yeah next round we will start with ganjam uh, thanks that uh, and good to see you uh, also in your uh, covid shape uh, uh, one of the things uh, which uh, is very striking is uh, that uh, Narendra Modi, how important, however important uh, he is, he is also the reflection of a societal mindset. Uh, it is not uh, just the one who is uh, uh, at the top. Uh, but uh, he is at the top because he uh, resonates, he reflects what is a very strong opinion in, uh, in India, and which is based on inequality, which is based not on compromise, which is based not on tolerance, but which is based, uh, which is very uh, self-centric, in the serving of uh, interests. Uh, and Narendra Modi is uh, an organizational man. I f we have to understand uh, the Hindutva uh, phenomenon also by the failure of the regime which uh, was before uh, Hindutva for a couple of decades, the ruling regime. Uh, which was Congress. And uh, at a very particular moment in time, the then leader of Congress, Indira Gandhi, decided to, uh, to do without uh, an organized party, but to speak to the people at large, not to the, not the, to the people who accepted uh, Congress as the best solution to India's uh, destiny. But uh, she could do without party followers as she uh, abolished the cadre, which was there very much so, also in Gujarat. Uh, and she centered authority and power in her own apparatus. That is very similar, but more organized, more systematic, and more committed than, uh, than uh, she did is what uh, Modi uh, does. So that organizational feature, those organizational features, you have to organize society in order to get control, not to give control to society, but to get control over society, uh, which is uh, important. Uh, uh, and then uh, Modi as the 
Gujarat flavor of the Harbinger uh, question, uh, the bringing uh, of India to a better uh, future. Uh, that is very much uh, phrased in terms of nationhood. In terms of nationhood, the nationhood now becomes the ultimate uh, objective of what Modi wants to realize and he did by India. And behind that uh, nationhood is only he did uh, in Hindutva. And that is very important. That former idea of plur plurality, of diversity, of having to live among you with people who have different beliefs, values, norms, and interests does not come easy to uh, Hindutva. And it is clear that Hindutva does not tolerate it. But I don't think that we should, uh, when we talk about Hindutva, we should talk only about uh, Modi. Absolutely not. The apparatus around him uh, with Amit Shah as his sidekick is very important in this realization of uh, a surveillance state and taking out uh, dissent dissenters, uh, voices who should not be there. Uh, so that apparatus, that makes me indeed make the comparison with Nazi Germany. The apparatus of a state surveillance in the control over society, which is important and which defines nationhood and uh, congruence with the the interest of the nation with Hindutva, which destroys the diversity, which has been the major, a very important, significant civilizational contribution of, of India, its diversity, its plurality, its multiformity, not its single-mindedness, not the sameness, not insisting on doing away with all those ideas, but all also all those people who do not belong and do not want to belong to the fold. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Let us go straight to um, Gancham. Well, on this question, I don't have to say anything because I have not followed Swaminarayan sect, but uh, uh, as you know, it's a predominantly of the Patidars, and Modi is very close to the community and the Swaminarayan sect, and he had gone out of his way to support Swaminarayan. Uh, sect in Gujarat, but simultaneously also supported a non feminine party that's because his interest is the party that's as such. And the dominant of feminine are the party that uh, And also the feminine is a major strength of his international support in America, in England, in this way. Uh, that's all that I would like to say that. But there was another question that somebody asked me. Uh, it's what is unique of Gujarat? And that really bothers me for the last several years. And I increasingly believe that there's nothing unique of Gujarat as a Gujarat society. I tend to believe that what has happened in Gujarat can happen elsewhere also if the same factors 
daily work. Uh, uh, also. In a more or less because you cannot reproduce the society itself. One thing is that what I mentioned during my talk is that unlike other places, other many places that you know, because you don't have enough historical studies of a different regions, or I'm, at least I'm not aware of them. So unlike the South India of Tamil Nadu or Kerala or, or Maharashtra, or in North India, Gujarat somehow had no backward caste or deprived caste movement. So there were the resistance and revolt. But among the middle class, as it happened elsewhere, and that was the absence. And therefore, the middle that OBC, large backward caste, who are really a scatter, very heterogeneous. Uh, there's no way, nobody has tried to really unite. The Gujarat OBC gimmicks, and I seriously call gimmicks of 1980s of Madhusi Solanki, had just a electoral purpose without a backward caste politics, like the Luhia or in South India. And therefore, it immediately backfired. And the BJP could really handle well of the OPC. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it is now time for us to open up uh, the floor for questions. Um, and of course, as always, when it is a, a mixed seminar and webinar session, uh, we, we will take questions from the floor here in the room, as well as written question uh, from online, plus people online can raise their hand uh, and, 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 and ask questions uh, orally as well. So we'll try to handle that uh, as, as well as we can. Um, we will start with, with, with at least one question here from the room and then we will uh, go to, to some of the questions that are sitting there already uh, online. But let's start with uh, um, Avinash, I'll give you uh, the microphone now, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Bremen, Professor Shah, and Ed, for this fascinating kind of conversation. Uh, see, I want to push this, you know, uh, this question has been asked partly, and I, I've, you know, Professor Shah has also kind of uh, offered some response to this, but my question is slightly different. It's not about why Gujarat is unique. My question is why Gujarat? Uh, here is an ideology. The key architects, historically speaking, comes from Marathi Brahmins, Savarkar, even the RSS chief, the first, you know, Gulwalkar. And there's a particular salience and appeal of Hindutva in, in parts of Maharashtra, which is still there. Their demographic focus, simply because of sheer numbers and because it's the Hindi belt, is UP Bihar, primarily, but not just, of course, I appreciate that. And yet, the idea of Hindutva taking off as a uh, you know, in a political sense, especially during the, you know, post-Babri uh, in Gujarat. Why Gujarat? And for me, this is something I, I hear the point that there is perhaps not enough counter-mobilization of some sort. But to me, I wonder whether there is something else to be said about identities rather than societies as such, where Marathi identity has a different caliber of interaction with Hindu nationalism. Uh, when that Gujarati identity has not had that kind of challenge to Hindu nationalism either, uh, even though the idea of being Gujarati is quite quite consequential in in cultural sense, in social sense, in a transnational sense. So this is a, I, I, you know if I could encourage you perhaps to elaborate this. It, why is it that it, it's Gujarat which is considered the so-called laboratory? and not Uttar Pradesh, even though we saw the results of Uttar Pradesh elections re recently, uh, which has sort of shown a very decisive shift away 
uh, from regionalism or regional political parties. Um, and even in Maharashtra, the Shiv Shena is holding ground, but uh, we don't know for how long, right? Uh, so this, this question has always rankled me. If I look at the larger kind of uh, ecosystem, so to say, of the Hindu right, uh, Gujarat uh, being the space where it actually took off, is there something more than just caste, caste, class, or just social dynamics? Is there something more that explains the timing of it? Because riots we have seen, whether engineered or not, happen in Delhi, happen in Mumbai, happen uh, in different parts of the country. It's not a Gujarat-focused phenomenon. Neither are they a BJP-centric phenomenon either, right? Communal violence is, has happened during Congress regimes too, in Gujarat as well. So why Gujarat? Why then? Is there something else going on over there? Thank you. Thanks so much. I, we have a question at the tail end there, and then we'll go to the to the written questions on the on the, on the chat afterwards. Um, thank you. Uh, am I right in thinking that uh, Gujarat has a disproportionate number of non-resident Indians, and is that a factor? It has been suggested that the uh, BJP was created in the diaspora. Uh, and I, will not, I mean, some people argue about that. Uh, and is that a factor which is relevant in the fact that both Gujarat and Maharashtra have got a disproportionate number of non-resident Indians? And could you give some background about that? Thank you. Um, let us let us just take a couple of more questions here from from the chat and and add them to 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 the next round that 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 you can then in a sense pick and choose between the questions to 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 answer um, yeah. um so the first question reads question for both panelists what is the gujarati norm gandhi or modi and the second question reads I have a comment to make. Can you help me to intervene from afar, Frank Perlin? So I think you'd like to unmute and speak. Okay, well, please, uh, please Frank would, would like to intervene. This is the time. Um, I think maybe Frank, if you could sort of just type in the chat and then I'll read this second question. From resistance to co-option of the oppressed, it seems that both of you see a subaltern Hindutva and intensifying the power of propertied classes slash castes. Then I was wondering, how do you see the UNA movement in Gujarat and the ongoing farmers movement at the national level? Thank you. All, all big questions. And of course, we, we also have, have the question left over from last time, maybe uh, that one of Ed's question, uh, who is the book for, maybe still sits there as well. Um, should, we, should we ask uh, Gansham to start um, commenting on, on, on these questions? Well, I have, I have no follow-up questions, but the, uh, whatever I follow up, two questions. The first question is why Gujarat? Uh, and that's also, I do not say I have a definite answer. It's a daily puzzle. Uh, because in my past, uh, uh, RSS is a stronghold but BJP could not develop what BJP could do in Gujarat. I think there are two possible explanations that I can give. One is what I say is unlike Maharashtra, Gujarat didn't have the Beko Trust movement. And the second and more important that what I feel is the beginning of the uh, RSS or Hindu tool, the base was among the traders. And the traders in Gujarat, because Gujarat 
does not have a Brahmin as a dominant class. It's a Banya that dominates. So it's a mercantile community. That and mercantile communities of Gujarat and those who become the mercantiles, the Patidar, uh, the world over, they share the same culture kind of things uh, that might be contributing for the rise of Hindutva, rise of Modi from 70s onwards. Uh, and that is because Maharashtra also had a pair, pair movement and still have a pair movement of the uh, Siv Seda. Gujarat doesn't have to counter an alternative uh, conservative Hindu movement. So Modi had a free head. Still, one has to probe further that what are the other factors of it? So I, I personally believe that Gujarat does not have, like many other parts of it, uh, states, uh, is a strong Gujarati identity. Uh, and that, that was the reason why in 1956, Mahujat movement did not get support as it got in Maras. This was the first time the Gujarat identity was raised by the former Congress given by Patel on the issue of Nirmala. But the economic interest comes rather than a cultural interest. I think Gujarati upper caste, that mindset for the economic interest, who were still against the universal interest, became a party to the Gujarati justice or injustice. And on that, the Modi very skillfully played in the subsequent year. And during his regime and thereafter, more important thereafter, he raised the issues of a son of the soil for himself. He raised the issues that he carries Gujarati identity at a national level. So he mixed the Hindutva and Gujarati identity that he, what is constructed at the national level. Uh, and that worked. So after 2014, uh, there was an upset against the BJP. He repeatedly used Gujarati identity himself is the son of the soil, representative of Gujarat at the national level in all elections. And he visited to elections uh, in 17 and 19 frequently. The central argument was Gujarati representing the India. That's all. Thank you. Thanks. Let us go straight to Jan. <clears throat> well, on the question of uh of why Gujarat, uh, and it has already been mentioned uh, by Gansham, uh, uh, the particular mercantile capitalism uh, that is uh, very strong in uh, Gujarat uh, has played a major role in bringing up uh, BJP where it is now. And uh, we also have to contextualize this in the in the in the economy of uh, of Gujarat. Uh, it's uh, not a coincidence that uh, Adani and Ambani uh, are Gujarati, and they are the major uh, powers, uh, money powers uh, between uh, behind uh, uh, BJP and, uh, and Modi, uh, of course. Uh, it is a kind of uh, a mercantile capitalism which uh, uh, makes uh, BJP very vulnerable to crony capitalism, uh, of course, and forgetting about the Bharat uh, ID, uh, uh, it is big business, but, uh, and that's what also uh, Modi wanted to attract to, uh, to Gujarat, Tata, 
luring him away from uh, Bengal and trying to and giving him a place. It came to nothing, of course, uh, the small car, but giving him a place in uh, in Gujarat. And uh, in my thing, in my thinking, uh, the weakest side of uh, of uh, Modi and BJP is the economy. Uh, is the economy? He uh, has not been able to deliver. The slogan with which he came to power of uh, 20 million jobs uh, in a short time. Uh, the employment creation is not happening. Uh, and that is has been turned around now in a new doctrine, which he has, uh, which he is preaching, that of self-reliance. If you are not self-reliant, you don't count. If you cannot organize your own livelihood, that's your problem, but so you're also your fault. That's your defect. We see back uh, the return of the non-deserving poor, a kind of social Darwinist mentality, which blames those who can't make it for their own sins. They are defective in not being able to become self-reliant. And that leads now to new legislation, which says that uh, those people won't also be able to be, be given, won't, won't be given uh, the provisions of the state, be it uh, the PDS card or uh, public works, Narega. They should be uh, thrown out of those provisions. If you are not self-reliant, if you cannot organize your own livelihood, and that's indeed a very typical uh, Gujarati trait, to be self-employed, if not being a boss yourself, then at least to be in control of yourself on what you are doing and what you are, where you are working and uh, what you earn uh, with that. That, that, that uh, <coughs> taste, uh, self-reliance is very important. Uh, but I wonder if it is more important in uh, Gujarat than anywhere else. So when I say, uh, from my point of view, uh, I'm speculating, of course, as all as all of us do, that will be the weak side of uh, BJP, not be able to deliver uh, the economy which uh, a great India uh, needs in order to uh, take its role in the globalized uh, economy. The economy, the economic management is very poor. It has been poor for a very long time, but under Hindutva, it has not become better. And that may be the, the most vulnerable side of uh, Hindutva. Thanks, Jan. And I think there's time for one more round of questions. Um, let me start by, by apologizing to those online, uh, Frank, Perlin and others that wanted to, to talk, to speak, because it seems not to be possible in this setup. So uh, hopefully we can get their written questions instead. So we'll, we'll return to them in a minute. But first, we have a couple of questions here. Alessandra first there. <coughs> Yeah, thanks a lot for this session. There's a lot of food for thoughts. I want to sort of make a comment on timelines uh, and uh, perhaps also connected to your last uh, um, reflections on this um, uh, rhetoric of this reliance um, that the BJP carries with it. Uh, from the 1980s, we also have seen uh, a rise of neoliberalism pretty much everywhere. In India, of course, uh, sort of the timeline of liberalization is 91, but for many, many have commented how already the Rajiv era was strongly connected with the role in of neoliberal policies. So I wonder uh, how uh, the BJP rhetoric has been amplified by neoliberalism. Also sort of noting that neoliberalism itself hasn't been really able to deliver uh, uh, economically, but this doesn't seem to have stopped is uh, rise and rise. So uh, if you could comment on that, on the extent to which uh, 
the role in neoliberalism in India has uh, further amplified the type of rhetoric they will see as dominant uh, um, in the context of the, uh, uh, the rise to power of BJP. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a question further down there. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. My question is also um, kind of in conjunction with the previous question. So like, um, perhaps like in context of like the 2002 Gujarat riots, um, like what would you say is the impact of this kind of religious violence on like economic development? Like, would you say there's some kind of causal mechanism um, or like link between like religious repression and the health of the economy or vice versa? Like when the economy begins to have a downturn, does the BJP, um, focus more on his like anti-Muslim rhetoric to kind of um, distract from the fact that they aren't performing that well in terms of the economy. So what is your um, opinion on the causal me mechanism either way? Thank you. Thank you. And could we see if there are more questions online? Uh, meanwhile, uh, maybe I can put in a question here as well, uh, which is relating to the relationship between the Congress and and the BJP. Uh, is Congress part of the solution or is it just BJP light? Uh, and with many of the cases, many of the argument here is that it has all been part of a historical tra trajectory. Uh, but uh, right now, can, can a broad alliance uh, that can challenge BJP be, be put together if it doesn't involve the Congress? Um, so the next question reads, are we not laying too much importance to Modi? Isn't it Brahminism, the caste system that is the main roadblock? It has always been there. And then the next one reads, how is Gandhi and Gandhi's interpretation and practice of Hinduism understood in the common sense in the current scenario? Excellent. And unfortunately, we, we have hardly and it does look as if there are others that would like to come in here uh, after seven o'clock. So uh, we, we have five minutes for, for a few short, sharp comments. Um, so we start with Jan, yes, this time and go to Gantian to, to finish it. And you only have a couple of minutes, I'm sorry. It is uh, the impossible, but there you go. Well, uh, following up on what I said on mercantile uh, capitalism, uh, neoliberalism was all uh, was already in in Gujarat before it uh, beca became uh, the mission uh, over, all over the world. You know, it was already in the 1960s or 70s that Gujarat advertised in economic and political weekly, "Come to Gujarat. There are no labor laws here." Uh, that kind of thinking and that kind of fabric is very strong in uh, in uh, in uh, Gujarat. So neoliberalism found a fertile ground, but it was already there. It was not. It was not there. But the difference is the later variety of neoliberalism did not filter in terms of redistribution. To the lower to the bottom uh, classes uh, of the population in Gujarat as it had been doing somewhat under uh, uh, under Congress uh, but um, from the 1990s onwards there was indeed an accelerating uh, economic growth in Gujarat but uh, those who do, did not benefit from it but were more exploited were the people at the bottom uh, of economy and uh, society. So the polarization has enormously increased. And that also explains why particularly the middle classes are so eager on Hindutva because they don't want to look over their shoulder to those who are left behind. Let them remain left behind. I'm, I'm truly sorry, Jan. We, we will have to go on for the last comments from uh, Gansham. Gansham, a couple of minutes for you. Gansham, would you like to comment? Uh, a couple of minutes uh, responses to the question, then we have to finish the, the, the session. Oh. <laughs> 
Well, <laughs> I don't have to add anything at present. But, uh, <laughs> but let me let me say something about the Gujarat model. <laughs> because the Gujarat model has succeeded the national level because the marketing of Narendra Modi, but also a Gujarat which is relatively economically developed. Uh, and that was not because of Modi, but since 1960 onwards. And Modi cleverly marketed, because I have seen uh, outside Gujarat, wherever I go to South India or not, uh, everybody was in praise of Modi because he was providing a jobs, providing health and so on and so forth. Uh, and another neoliberal economy, you see, where the earlier government, UPA government, was in a declining stage. People thought that this is a man who provides a job and industrial development everywhere. Uh, not only in India, but in outside, the liberal scholars were so impressed by that, so they ignored the Hindutva aspect of Narendra Modi. And in 2004, if you see the media, most of the liberals started supporting Modi, assuming that uh, Hindutva car would remain in the background. And, and I think that is, that, is, that is where we have to stop, unfortunately. They're, the next group of people that have booked the rooms are standing impatiently here. So that is the absolute limit of time, unfortunately. So thank you and apologies for, for interrupting us. Thank you to the Thank you to the, to the people present here in the seminar, to those attending the webinar, and to everyone contributing, and to the team making it all running so smoothly. Thank you, everyone, and uh, see you for the next seminar. Thank you. And apologies for cutting you short. Uh